Now for today's program. Congressman Jamie Raskin is the U.S. Representative for Maryland's 8th Congressional District, and he serves on the House Judiciary Oversight, mm -hmm. Administration, and Rules Committees. He served as the lead House Manager in the second Senate impeachment trial of former President Donald Trump. This summer, he was appointed by House Speaker Nancy Pelosi to serve on the Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. Prior to Congress, Representative Raskin was a three-term state senator in Maryland and a professor of constitutional law for more than a quarter century at American University Washington College of Law. This past November, Congressman Raskin was the first recipient of Moment Magazine's newly named Ruth Bader Ginsburg Human Rights Award. He has authored several books, including his latest, the New York Times number one bestseller, Unthinkable, Trauma, Truth, and the Trials of American Democracy. Joining the congressman today is Amy E. Schwartz. Amy is Moment Magazine's opinion and book editor, as well as editor of the Mo magazine's popular Ask the Rabbi section. Before coming to Moment, Amy was a longtime editorial writer and op-ed columnist at the Washington Post, covering education, science, and culture. She was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in commentary in 1988 and was a three-time winner of the Newspaper Guild's Bernie Harrison Memorial Award for commentary and criticism. Amy has also worked at Harper's Magazine, The New Republic, and The Wilson Quarterly. She is president of the Non-Denominational Jewish Studies Center in Washington, D.C., and speaks and runs workshops on topics of Jewish commentaries, psalms, and literature nationwide. Amy is the editor of the book, Can Robots Be Jewish? and Other Pressing Questions of Modern Life. Please welcome Congressman Jamie Raskin and Amy E. Schwartz. Welcome, Jamie. Um, Congressman, I guess I should say. Um, it's wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for coming on this program. And thank you, I want to say thank you for writing this wonderful book, which I think when when someone writes a book that is so open and re self-revelatory, it's sort of, it's a very, it's an act of great generosity. So um, I want to start by saying that. Um, thank you, Amy. That is... Uh... Super high praise coming from you. Um, I've always loved your writing, which is so lucid and beautiful. And um, uh, thank you for having me on. I've been looking forward to doing this. Great. So we'll start dark, if you don't mind. So um, when this book starts, you're in a dark, dark, horrible place. Um, and so is the country. And so in the opening pages of this book, you've just lost your beloved son. Tommy, and you drag yourself out of the house and you go down to the Capitol for January 6th. And there you, as you write, then you and the country are sort of traumatized all over again. And then you lead the impeachment team and then you write this book. So a year later, are you at a different place? And can you talk a little bit about that journey? And I mean, also then is the country at a different place? But those are, those are too many questions. Start with you, please. Well, <clears throat> let's see, the, writing the book was an act of um, great catharsis and therapy for me. Um, I cannot say the same thing of doing the audio version, which was a, a really wrenching and difficult process emotionally to read it all aloud okay. again. But I know a, a, lot of, a lot of people have been listening to it. A lot of my friends have been listening to it and they like doing it that way. And they find an even greater intimacy to the whole thing. Um, but um, I guess I would have to tell you that um, I, I feel Tommy very much with me um, and uh, I feel a continuing desire and passion to honor his values and his visions and his dreams for the world. Um, and um, and we're st still completely in the thick of the fight to defend uh, America's democratic institutions and our values against um, extremist authoritarian attack and ideology. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you feel as if the country's been on a journey of processing um, January 6th? Well, uh, on the... The one year January 6th anniversary, I felt like the people who are not denying it and the people who are recognizing it, in fact, are on that emotional odyssey to 
reckon with what it means and then to try to translate um, uh, you know, our fears and our hopes into some practical changes. I mean, we need to fortify our democratic institutions at every level from the ground level of our windows and doors at the Capitol all the way through um, our voting systems, the right to vote, the gerrymandering of our elections, the Electoral Count Act, the 12th Amendment. I mean, you know, we have a lot of work to do, but I, but I, I was very moved and encouraged by the observances and the remembrances that took place both on Capitol Hill, but also across the country and in the various vigils. I got to go a couple, to a couple of those. And I think that more than half of the country is observing these events with the proper level of solemnity and appreciation for the battles ahead. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've, you've learned a lot, obviously, about the process of grieving as you've gone through a year of bereavement. Um, but there's also a process nations go through, right? Um, do you, the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, things like that, do you feel like the work you're, first of all, the work that was done in the impeachment, which although the votes didn't, weren't there in the end, there was a lot of good work done as the book, the book talks about, you know, how much was accomplished by the impeachment team when you were leading it. Um, but, um, and now you're working, now the select committee, um, not the select committee, the, the commission. Um, the select committee. You, the select committee. Do you feel as if um, that's, the that good work is being done, that the, and the nation's going through a process with, with what you guys are doing? Yes, absolutely. You know, in politics, like in life, you know, no good act is ever wasted. And the Senate impeachment trial really turns out to have been a hugely important thing to do, I think. I mean, for one thing, the vote was 57 to 43. So it was a 14 vote win, you know, from just the looks of it to anybody, you know, I'd explain to all these foreign reporters why we lost with a 57 to 43 vote. I mean, Trump beat that constitutional spread because of the two thirds requirement, but it was still the most sweeping bipartisan vote to convict a president in the United States in an impeachment trial in American history. You know, we've only had four trials. We had Andrew Johnson, we had Bill Clinton, which of course was ridiculous, and we had Trump one and then Trump two. And so this was the most definitive, authoritative, bipartisan, bicameral pronouncement, at least as a statement of legislative fact that the president had committed the charged offense, which in this case was of course incitement to violent insurrection against the union. Um, so we told that story, we convicted him in the court of public opinion, I think, and we convicted him in the eyes of history and we began to lay out that case. Now, what's happening in the select committee is a little bit different because it's not a focus on one guy and one crime. It's uh, to fulfill the mandate in House Resolution 503 to report back on the entire scope of events, the causes behind them, and then what we need to do to ready ourselves in the future to prevent such an attack. So we've got a far more sweeping mandate right now and we're making overwhelming progress. I mean, you know, I would say more than 90% of the people have come and conducted interviews and given us information. That's more than 400 people now. And we have more than 50,000 documents and um, hundreds of thousands of photos, videos. I mean, this was the, most documented violent insurrection in history, undoubtedly, because everybody had their cell phones and a lot of the participants were putting stuff up online. So we're gonna get the truth out. And of course, everybody's hearing about the coterie of advisors around Trump who are refusing to testify, right? So it's Mark Meadows, it's Steve Bannon, it's Michael Flynn, it's, you know, that group of people. And we're going to be able to tell the story even without them, but it's going to be a lot better and more finely textured if we get them to testify honestly, as they're supposed to be doing. But I think we're bringing a lot of hope to the country right now. Uh, my dad used to say, uh, I quote it in the book, that democracy needs a ground to stand on, and that ground is the truth. Mm. Uh, you can't build a democracy on lies or big lies or propaganda 
or disinformation. The people have the right to the truth. I mean, the truth is hard enough to know when you're going for the truth, but it's really hard to get at if you're spreading lies and you're, you know, you're denying what happened and you're trying to sweep everything under the rug. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So since um, I'm going to shift gears just a little bit, I mean, you technically on paper, you represent the 8th District of Maryland, but you, you represent, you have a much larger constituency and in this work and you have sort of from the first. Um, you talk in the book about how, in a sense, you now have an additional constituency, which is people who have undergone a tragedy like yours or who have depression in their families or who struggle with it themselves. Can you talk a little bit about what you've been trying to say and convey to those people? I know that there was a, a like a check-in service created in Tommy's memory, but what other what other things, you know, what other what other things do you say to people should be done? Well, you know, that there are a ton of new uh, memorials and legacies that are being created in Tommy's name. There is that one in Maryland. There's a special phone number that people can call if they want to have a medical check-in with a counselor or with a with a doctor. But um, I mean, there have been all kinds of internships at human rights organizations and animal welfare and animal rights organizations and scholarships and we're doing, um, you know, we, we set up a fund in Tommy's name, the Tommy Raskin Memorial Fund for People and Animals, uh, which is run by his sisters, Hannah and Tabitha, and a bunch of cousins and friends and stuff. And um, on Tommy's birthday, which is January 30th, there will be uh, a day of service and day of kindness where people are asked to jo just go commit an act of kindness and to record it. And then we're putting them up online so people can see everything that's been done. So, um, you know, his spirit, his memory, his values are really alive um, in all of the people who are so heartbroken by the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I talk a lot about trauma in the book and how trauma is something that strips from you everything most joyful and precious and beloved um, and leaving you just bereft and destitute. Um, but if you're willing to, you know, go to the depths with trauma, it will bring you back to a place of connection and depth with other people and a level of understanding and a level of empathy that you never could have dream, dreamed of before, you know? And uh, I imagine trauma is a Greek God. There is no Greek God of trauma, it turns out, but um, I imagine trauma is a Greek God looking both to this horrific side and looking also to this side of connection and reconstitution. And, um, you know, and if you want to say to the God of trauma, well, it's not a fair trade, thank you, but I'd rather not have it. Um, that's the bite of it because it's not up to you. It's just forced upon you. So you can, you know, you can make of it what you will if you're willing to do that. Yeah. I, I know there are some um, very touching passages in the book where President Biden reaches out to you and sort of out of his own experience with this kind of loss is able to sort of make contact with you. And um, it sounds like you've been doing that too with other people. Is that that's sort of what you're saying? That, you know, yeah, well, President Biden is the perfect president for our days because you know my, my family is hardly unique in terms of what we've gone through. I mean, 800,000 families are still mourning someone who they've lost through COVID-19. And that's just wrenching and dreadful. Comparable numbers we've lost in the opioid crisis, the emotional and mental health crisis, which is engulfing young people, the dramatic increase in suicide, the gun violence, um, alcohol and drug abuse. I mean, you name it. And um, so we are a wounded society. There is a lot of pain and injury out there. And um, I think Joe Biden um, is just, you know, perfectly appropriate to the moment because he's been through so much trauma in his life and he's been forced to 
connect to other people and he does resonate very deeply with what other people have gone through. So he's been very good to Sarah and me and uh, our family. And, um, you know, the Bidens are a family that understand the, the darkness and the light that is just the fate of humanity. So since this is this is, since this is a moment conversation, um, I'll ask us a, a question about spiritual things. Um, have there been other resources that have been helpful to you spiritually, and you know, religious resources? Um, can you talk a little bit about your own Jewish background? In that? Well, you know, we belong to Temple Sinai, uh, and uh, Rabbi Roos um, conducted our COVID safe graveside service on January 5th, the day before the insurrection took place. Um, and, I, and I do describe that day um, in, in the book. Um, and uh, Cantor Crone was there with us and they were just lovely and, you know, remarkable people. Um, and uh, um, People have reached out from all different kinds of directions and faiths, and there's so many beliefs about it. And you know, death is obviously the the great unknowable and inscrutable in everybody's life. And so, I've I've liked sort of the kaleidoscopic wisdom that I've enjoyed as people have come to talk to me about their interpretation and their there are ways of dealing with it. I mean, really, that's what these belief systems are about. I mean, it's what are the what are the coping mechanisms that humanity acquires to for the, for the unknowable to deal with? Yeah, just just the, the the fatal dimension of being alive. You know, Tommy used to say. Uh, it's hard to be a human, and that's one of the main reasons it's hard to be a human. I I had uh, some wonderful conversations with our friend Dar Williams, the folk rock singer who studied religion when she was at uh, Wesleyan, and uh, and Dar's thought a lot about it. And so I record some of the things that she told me that I that I found moving. You know, is that the same Jewish community you grew up in in this area, Temple Sinai? No, well, no, Temple Sinai, we joined later, uh, and, um, but our, you know, this, that was our kid's synagogue, and, yeah, it's our synagogue. Of course, as a member of Congress now, I, I get to go to all the synagogues and all the churches and all the mosques, and the, you know, the, the only price for my attendance is I ask everybody to give me one joke about their congregation or their religion, so I have a, a wonderful collection of religious humor. I think I once uh, offered to share that with you, but I uh, I don't think I made it in time for your your joke, your special joke uh, symposium. I remember <laughs> that I was so yeah. sad. We uh, yeah. we were all set to tell a joke. You can tell us you can tell us a Jewish joke anytime. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a good religious joke. It's not exactly a Jewish one, but uh, um, Saint Peter is up in heaven and he's walking down the hallway and he passes by. God's office, and then he peeks his head into God's office, and he sees that God's got his head in his hands like this, and St. Peter says, God, what's wrong? You look really upset, and God says, I am really upset. I'm in love with an atheist, and she doesn't even know I exist. So <laughs> There's something in that joke for everybody. So I like that. That's yeah. very fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, one of the themes that comes through very strongly in your book, and I think you've already touched on it, you kind of alluded to it a couple times, is, I mean, you're kind of a radical empath. You connect with everybody, right? Nobody is mentioned in your book without a sort of a sentence of praise. Um, and well, so- Well, no, nothing compared to Tommy Raskin, who really was a universal empath, yeah. You must get it from somewhere, you must have gotten it from somewhere, but, um, but I, I'm just curious, because you connect with everyone and, on the other hand, you have to act, you've been, you know, you, you're, you're called upon to act in a very partisan way um, in, in these, these partisan battles. Um, can you talk about sort of how you navigate this challenge, um, the tension between, you know, being a human being and being a, being a partisan? Well, the, that, that's one of the great 
tensions of being in politics for me anyway, because, you know, I, I am a middle child. I like to bring people together. Um, you know, the, my siblings have always made fun of me for being an eternal optimist, for just, you know, being Mr. Rose Colored Glasses and, you know, for just blocking out all negative information. Um, Sarah's constantly making fun of me about that. And, um, you know, and I do record in the book how I feel like for the first time I confronted that as a serious topic because I wonder to what extent that sunny optimism has blinded me in my life to real dangers out there just because I don't, you know, I either I don't want to deal with them, I can't deal with them, or I want to will them out of existence and make things better, you know, and um, so, um, you know, I talked about regretting not using the word suicide um, and, um, you know, more and just making it part of things. And I certainly regret not using the word fascism um, at the risk of being impolite to people. Um, I mean, these are real things. So this has been, I suppose, the the growing up process for me. Um, you know, I I still feel fundamentally the same way, but at least intellectually, um, I want to place a lot more emphasis on these dark realities. I mean, we're not going to make it through if we don't understand that American democracy is under serious authoritarian attack and threat. And it just goes way beyond my ability to befriend Republican colleagues. It's just not, that, that's just not up to the task. Well, you know? well let, let me let me go back to that because you, you um, I was gonna say that on the positive side of this, you know, what about what's, how do you go about finding common ground on the other side? I mean, are there, are there ways that you can still reach across? You know, do you, are there any heroes you see on the other side? Also, just parenthetically, I have to ask, are you really yeah. friends with Trey Gowdy? You say that in, in a passing in your book. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I was very friendly with Trey Gowdy. I wasn't there in Congress during the Benghazi stuff. Okay. So I didn't have the same image and impression of him that others did. I just wasn't there for it. I mean, and Liz Cheney, I would say, is one of my favorite people in Congress, I love her and Adam Kinzinger, and there's some other Republicans I've been close to, but of course, you know, we're on the same side of this gulf now. Um, and um, I mean, I always believe what Lincoln said in the second inaugural address about, um, you know, the mystic chords of memory and the underlying bonds of affection that are necessary to keep a society together, especially a very, heterogeneous, pluralistic society with centrifugal tendencies like the United States of America. I mean, the bonds of affection are essential. So I do believe in that. I think that is real. But what I've also learned is that, you know, um, COVID-19 is real and some people wanted to deny it. And uh, fascism is a virus too. And that's real. And, um, you know, we, I don't, want to disappear these things just in wishful thinking are there are there any instances where people have surprised you positively with with good behavior um well sure i mean you know the, the, there were several more people in the house who voted for impeachment than I was aware of, and I'd been talking to most of them, but we ended up with 10, and I was thinking there might only be seven. And then we got seven Republican senators who joined 50 Democrats in the in the Senate to vote to convict, and that included, you know, Senator from Louisiana, uh, Senator from North Carolina, Burr, you know, they're from all over the country, the South, the Mid-Atlantic, New England, the Midwest, the West, you know. Um, those people, they did their jobs. I mean, Mike Pence did his job on January 6th. I mean, he, I think, you know, was overly sycophantic for the prior four years. But on that day, he really earned his salary and he was a constitutional patriot. 
They wanted to convince him to unilaterally proclaim powers in the vice president to reject electoral college votes from Arizona, Georgia, Pennsylvania to lower Joe Biden's vote total from 306 in electoral college to below 270. And that would have kicked the whole thing into the House of Representatives for a contingent election. And, um, you know, the reason for that, of course, is that in a contingent election under the 12th Amendment, we're not voting one member, one vote. We're voting one state, one vote. And they had 27 state delegations. And we had 22 and Pennsylvania was tied down the middle. So it would have been, you know, left on the sidelines. But even if Liz Cheney as the at-large rep for Wyoming had not voted for Trump, they still would have had 26 votes. And so if they could just have gotten Pence to do that, they would have pulled it off. Trump would have been prepared to invoke the Insurrection Act as his disgraced former national security advisor, Michael Flynn, was urging him to do. And he would have declared something like martial law, called in the National Guard, and then put down the chaos and the insurrection that he had unleashed against us, you know? So, uh, but, the, but several people surprised me that day and did the right thing. And, you know, despite how much Donald Trump has just put terror in everybody about the prospects of fascism and violent authoritarianism. Most people reject that. Most Americans are firmly in the camp of democracy and strong democracy. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's just philosophically speaking, I notice it's sort of the, the, the style the rhetorical style nowadays you see in a lot of um, people, especially online that um, no one's going to give anyone credit for a positive thing unless they're unless if, if they've done other bad things in the past. So, you know, you're not going to see Mike Pence hailed as a um, as a hero in those quarters. But um, it sounds like you're saying that sometimes when people do the right thing, you know, it's all in, in the in the context where it's hard for them. That's that can be very important. Right. Well, absolutely. I mean, especially when you consider the the general fragility of the human mind. I mean, I, I've watched an entire modern political party succumb to the hypnotic lies of one pretty deranged politician. I mean, that's an amazing thing to watch happen. I mean, I, I don't regard Trump's party like a modern political party anymore. It's much more like a religious political cult where, you know, repeated enough lies become accepted as the truth. And there were people who used to say stuff about Trump, like he was a sniveling coward and a compulsive liar and never should be anywhere near the White House. And those were Republicans like Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz and so on. And now they are just utterly servile and sycophantic to him. Um, and, you know, it's easy enough to say, well, you know, that's because they're afraid of him politically. He's going to endorse someone against them. So on. yeah, it starts off that way. And then at a certain point, they just start believing it. Mm -hmm. And that is where, you know, fascism comes from when you have huge groups of people who are willing to believe in lies and replace the truth and replace science and replace data with conspiracy theories and bigotry and disinformation. Mm -hmm. So um, just to follow up one more question on that general theme, um, I actually took a leaf from your, from your, your book and I thought I'd ask my, ask my kids, what, what should I ask? What should I ask you? And this was the question that emerged from my, from my, you know, sort of 20 something kids. Um, are there still any touchstones that everybody in the country can agree on? Like even looking at those people who stormed the, the, the Capitol, was there anything that both you and they can speak to about America that is a touchstone? Well, I mean, this is why, um, there's one reason why I love the constitution because I think everybody professes fidelity to the Constitution. I mean, there were people who were like waving the Constitution, even as they attacked the Congress and tried to disrupt the counting of electoral college votes under the 12th Amendment. Um, and so I think everybody professes love for the Constitution, 
most people haven't studied it and don't really analyze what's in there and you know the struggles that have gone into our unfolding constitution but you know, look we're we're not a society that's defined by one race or one ethnicity or one religion or one philosophy but we do have one constitution and so i think that that's a place that we can uh rally around um but closely connected to that has got to be the truth um and you know when you i think back to the original classes i took in philosophy you know it was a breakthrough when it was determined that the truth is defined as um uh knowledge that occurs when you believe something and it is true and you would believe it if it were true and you wouldn't believe it if it weren't true but we have in you know entire systems of political belief that violate the basic principles of empiricism and logic so of all the things of all the many projects and things that you do that you've started up i think my personal favorite and this is kind of a shout out is democracy summer you know the great a great multiplier of people's political activism and i hadn't realized till i read it in the book that that was also sort of a tommy thing that it was partly inspired yeah. by tommy i just can you just talk about democracy summer and your experiences with that well when i first ran for the state senate this is back in 2006 i was you know looking for a way to get my kids our three kids and then all of my nieces and nephews and just that whole generation involved and um Tommy reported he Tommy was my original recruit and he said he was having a hard time getting older teenage aunts and uh, well cousins to him um uh the aunts and um I'm sorry cousins but you know the, the boys and the girls my nieces and nephews to sign up to participate and he said they were saying stuff like well you know we can't put on our resume that uh we work for our uncle's losing <laughs> senate state senate campaign and <laughs> i said tell them one we're not going to lose and two they're not just coming to work on my campaign they're going to be part of democracy summer and tommy said well what's democracy summer and i said we're going to create a school within the campaign and we're going to train people about the history of uh social reform and political change in america and then we're going to train people how they become part of it by registering people to vote and canvassing and doing digital organizing and whatever it might be so uh so tommy really helped me so much in that campaign but we've kept democracy summer going and it's basically taken over my own campaign i mean it is my campaign where every summer now we get 100 150 young people high school and college age kids to come in and we give them the classes and we're teaching them but then they go out and work too and so it's a mixture of the theoretical and the practical in politics the DCCC um approached me about making it a nationwide program and last summer was the first summer and we had i think around 375 young people across the country do it in uh, like 30 different congressional districts and this summer uh we're shooting for 1000 democracy summer fellows and we're going to try to be in 50 or 75 congressional districts that is awesome i have to say when i first heard about this i came in on it a little late i just assumed that you had started it as a way of dealing with all the many many supporters and friends you had who were asking you to give their kids jobs and that this would cover everyone <laughs> well, helps also do some, <laughs> also do helps some with that no i mean what, what what the young people love about it is that it's not just saying well you can be my intern and then you know go and xerox stuff or i don't know we don't xerox anymore but whatever the equivalent of that is i mean just <laughs> go do something and um instead what we're saying is we want to invest in you as real organizers and leaders and creative thinkers in this process and we'll all do our share of that stuff including me and um you know that's part of what politics is but we also need people to bring their full hearts and minds into the campaigns too so we're almost I'm going to I have only one more question before we kick it over to the questions and we have a lot of people on this call so I think there will be good questions um but I'm basically this is going to be a framework at this is I'm going to ask let you preach so here's here's a story so I um I, I think I can say without um messing with my status as an interviewer that I I've, I've gone to a lot of your political events and um you know I'm kind of a camp follower 
And I remember right after the 2016 election, once um, getting getting a note about an event of yours and saying to my family, we were all so depressed, let's go to this Jamie event, maybe Jamie will cheer us up. And so we all went and we were listening and everyone was saying to you, Jamie, are we doomed? Are we doomed? <laughs> you know? And you were basically talking about how it looked pretty daunting, but that looking around you, you know, all the young people, all the activists, all the idealists, you couldn't help having hope. So I'm just going to throw that back to you and say, Jamie, you know, <laughs> are we doomed or is there hope? <laughs> no, we're, we're definitely not doomed. Um, you know, my, my dad used to say, uh, when everything looks hopeless, you're the hope. Um, and... Uh, I see people stepping up all over the place and we've got amazing people in the past to look to and amazing people in the future to look to. And um, there are such remarkable generations that have come before us that have um, built out the promise of America, like all the civilizing movements of our days, the civil rights movement and the women's movement, the LGBTQ movement, the labor movement, the human rights movement, um, you know, these are these are the nonviolent movements that are not based on beating up cops and punching out people's windows, but building real power through solidarity and a love of freedom and justice and the animating values of the country. And these are the movements that gave us the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act and the Equal Pay Act and the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act and Social Security and Medicare and so on. Um, these are these are positive movements that build people up, and um, of course, in my case, I've got the great Tommy Raskin, who um, was such a champion for human rights, for peace, for social justice, for animal welfare and animal rights, and the rights of all sentient beings. And um, you know, the title of the book's unthinkable because. What we went through in our family was unthinkable. What we went through as a country was unthinkable. But there's also a positive meaning that I try to end with, you know, maybe in the book where I say that Tommy thought thoughts about the future that were unthinkable now because he really thought that we could get to a place beyond hunger and poverty. We didn't have to organize society in a way where lots of people were left out and destitute. And we could get beyond war. We could leave war behind the way we have left behind witchcraft, the way we've left behind slavery, social practices that seem to be completely ingrained and sunk into the consciousness of humanity can be uprooted and replaced. So um, these young generations of um, new leaders and organizers give me a lot of hope. They are beyond the racism and anti-Semitism and the misogyny. They are um, you know, beyond authoritarianism and Donald Trump and all of that, they want something much greater from our democracy. And Tommy was a visionary in that sense of wanting a lot more out of democracy. Unfortunately, the new generation is a little bit beyond grammar too, but <laughs> that, that might just be my, my uh, increasingly curmudgeonly view of treatment of our beloved English language. But um, anyway, so yeah, nobody can give up hope that um, we don't have time for that because we got to save the democracy in order to confront climate change and deal with uh, the environmental calamities pressing upon us. So on a high note, thank you. I'm going to, on that high note, I will, I will thank you once again. It's been a pleasure and I'm going to throw you into the jaws of the questioners who I'm sure will be just as, um, just as, as upbeat and excited <laughs> as I was to talk to you. So thank you. Thank you both for that wonderful, wonderful conversation. Um, uh, Congressman, what I do want to um, ask, my synagogue is actually not too far from yours. I'm at Temple Emanuel in Kensington. And I know for a time that Tommy uh, taught in the religious school. Uh, do you have any idea what drew him to want to teach uh, Judaism to young children? Well, he was recruited to teach at Temple Emanuel by um, Heather Levy, who uh, I don't know exactly what her title was at that point, but she was, I think, commanded a stable of Sunday school teachers and she recruited Tombo. And uh, uh, I mean, he would, he would spend hours getting ready to go in and to teach about, you know, wh whatever, whatever the, the biblical stories were of the week or whatever the themes were, whatever the holidays were. He was 
totally into it, but he would often, you know, use that as kind of a launching point for some of his own philosophical investigations um, with the kids. Um, but he he loved it there. That's a great um, that's a great synagogue, of course. Um, and I think that, I mean, Tommy, who was a playwright, a poet, I mean, a, um, a stand-up spoken word performer, a great gamesman, stand-up comedian, all of this stuff. I mean, I think his driving passion really was moral philosophy. Um, and, um, you know, how should we live and how do we make decisions? And he was just a great teacher because he loved to ask young people about how they would make decisions in particular places and contexts. And, you know, that's what the great teachers do. They don't give you answers, but they they force upon you hard questions that make you think and examine your values. Thank you. Uh, someone would like to know if you could comment on the increase of anti-Semitism, both in this country and around the world. Well, um, uh, it's, it's alarming. Um, you know, we know that anti-Semitism, uh, like racism, um, is the gateway to destruction of liberal democracy. And it's obviously a lethal threat to the Jewish community. Um, and um, so we've got to do everything in our power to, to fight it. Um, and, you know, we've seen uh, a lot of the new authoritarian and autocratic and kleptocratic dictators and bullies of our day um, dabbling in anti-Semitism, um, you know, just as a, a mode of political operation. I mean, Orban in Hungary has taken his government in a decidedly authoritarian and anti-Semitic direction, and his campaigns are directed against George Soros. And Donald Trump just went and endorsed um, Viktor Orban in his re-election campaign. So, you know, all of the bullies and tyrants have found each other, and Donald Trump is right at the center of it, and they're all cheering for his return to power. Um, and they think, and not without reason, that it would be the end of democracy in America if he were to come back into power. So that's why I say this is um, the fight of our lives that we're in right now to defend democratic institutions. And um, I believe, and I'm speaking in a partisan way, but not in solely a partisan way, that the Democratic Party is the democracy today. And the survival of American democracy depends on the fortunes of our, of our political party. Thank you. Uh, somebody would like to know, uh, is there anything that can be done about those who have refused to come before the committee? And then what does that mean for the future of the subpoena? Well, the good news is that most people have testified freely and cooperated. Um, and so I want everybody to remember that we are making tremendous progress. But it's true that, you know, there's a handful of people uh, who have been infected with Donald Trump's conviction that uh, he's not subject to the rule of law. And um, Steve Bannon um, of Harvard Business School and Goldman Sachs and the international alt-right movement uh, believes that he's beyond the rule of law. Um, and, um, and Mark Meadows was kind of doing the hokey pokey. He had one foot in and one foot out. He gave us tens of thousands of documents and then Donald Trump got mad at him about his book and called it fake news. And he made Mark Meadows call his own book fake news. That might be a, a new low for, um, for literary authors all over the world when you have to denounce your own book. But, um, uh, and at that point he withdrew from participating in our process. So look, we, we have the power to subpoena anybody, including, um, uh, politicians and including people who are friends with former presidents. You know, our constitution, unlike some other constitutions on earth, doesn't have an office of former president. In America, if you're not president, you're just a citizen like everybody else. You know, you're not a, they, we, you don't, I mean, there's, there's just not a constitutional position for that. So people should keep that in mind. Uh, 
I mean, it's a credit to his royalist ambitions and pretensions that people think he's got some kind of special perch from which he can cast a spell on his friends so that they don't have to testify. I mean, give me a break. This is America, all right? Everybody is subject to the rule of law. If you're a witness to a crime, you're a participant in a crime, you got to testify unless you want to plead the fifth. Then you come in and you say that the answer to that question might incriminate me. Fair enough. We let that go. But otherwise, you can't just sit there like Steve Bannon on the couch and blow off the Congress of the United States, the people's representatives in Article 1. Thank you. When you vote on a controversial piece of legislation, what do you consider or pri prioritize the most? Your own view or position or what you think is best? What you think is best for your constituents, for Maryland, or for the U.S.? <clears throat> I would just have to say yes, um, <laughs> you know. Um, I mean, I'm probably um, sufficiently saturated in the political profession that um, I don't experience the cognitive dissonance among those various levels. Um, but uh, I, I guess I would say that I'm thinking primarily of my constituents first and what it's gonna be like for people who live in my district, including me and my family and my, you know, friends and my neighbors. So um, I sort of dissolve the distinction between my constituents and myself pretty quickly. The question of, you know, my district versus the country, I've not really had to deal with that except that I am, you know, a very passionate, avid champion for the NIH and you know, one of the very first things I did is when Donald Trump wanted to slash the NIH budget by $5 billion. And I got up, I made my first speech and I said, you know, how could the president want to cut the NIH budget when it's the NIH that is doing the investigative research into all of the killer diseases of our days, like lung cancer and breast cancer and cystic fibrosis and multiple sclerosis and malignant narcissistic personality disorder, you know, um, all of these problems. And this is where the research is hap happening. And we turned it around and we got billions of dollars extra for NIH. Um, and I've always fighting for more money for NIH. And sometimes I think, well, am I, you know, do, am I just believe in my own propaganda so much? I mean, maybe I'm going overboard with NIH or with NOAA or FDA because they're in my district. So I've got to be aware of that. But I've generally been able to convince myself that these institutions are centrally positive for the country and for the people of the country. And I, I, I hope that's right. And, um, you know, it might be a different thing if I you know, represented the Pentagon because I've voted against most military budgets, which I consider which I consider to be extremely bloated um, and totally, you know, overblown. That, I mean, that would probably put me to the test because, you know, I imagine it would be harder to do that if the Pentagon is in your district. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what are your uh, thoughts on the prospects of the Voting Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, and the Freedom to Vote Acts? Well, we of course have passed them out of the house. They're absolutely essential. We got to protect weekend voting. We got to protect early voting. We got to protect mail-in balloting. We've got to stop the voter purges. Um, we got to overthrow the gerrymandering of our districts. The politicians should not be choosing the voters before the voters choose the politicians. Um, all these things we've been fighting for, but um, you know, th there's precious little time left to pull a rabbit out of the hat um, because. You know, we've got the 50 Democrats. Um, I don't know that there are any Republicans willing to support it, but in any event, we're certainly not gonna get up to 60 in the Senate and you need 60 votes for anything because of the filibuster. It's not 51 as a majority that you need, it's 60. And so- about the filibuster, can I jump in? Yeah, what did you say? Oh, I just wondered if you could, how do you feel about the filibuster since it's, well, not, your, it's not in the House? The so. filibuster, um, I believe is, profoundly antithetical to the Constitution. I mean, the premise of the Constitution in all of our political institutions is that majorities rule. So it's 218 in the House, it's 51 in the Senate, 
It's five votes from the Supreme Court, which is why we have so many 5-4 decisions. And that is the background default presumption in our Constitution. Anytime we use a different number, like two-thirds to override a veto, or two-thirds to convict an impeached president in the Senate, or two-thirds to ratify a treaty, the Constitution spells it out explicitly as a departure. So the constitutional presumption is it's 51 votes to get any legislation passed, except by rule, the Senate has said, except it's 60 votes, not 51. I mean, it just makes no sense. It really is unconstitutional in the literal sense. It is outside of the dictates of the Constitution. So um, it's also um, a rule that more than 100 exceptions have been carved out from. So trade promotion authority, budget reconciliation, judicial nominations, which is why Donald Trump got to install more than 400 unqualified Federalist Society bloggers in the federal bench over his four years in office, right? So if it's important enough for all those things, surely it's important enough for voting rights legislation, which goes right to the heart of the democratic sovereignty of the people over our own government. People can't vote and have their right to vote respected, then we're not really a democracy. We're not operating like a democracy. You know, Tocqueville said that in America, democracy is always either moving forward and progressing and growing, or it's retreating and shriveling away. And of course, we've been in a shriveling away, retreating mode for many years now. We got to get back on the pro-democracy track. We need to get back into the trajectory of statehood, including for more than 700,000 taxpaying, draftable American citizens in Washington, D.C., the only citizens of a national capital on earth who are not represented in their national legislature. We, got, we need Puerto, Puerto Rican statehood for three and a half million American citizens who paid the bitter price of non-statehood during Hurricane Maria when Donald Trump threw some paper towels at them instead of giving them hundreds of millions of dollars of aid that they got cheated out of. So we got to think very seriously about where democracy is in this century and we got to move forward. Um, and instead of being dragged backwards to the Jim Crow politics that have taken over the GOP. Thank you. Uh, we, we are quickly, quickly running out of time. I've got two last questions for you. Uh, one is how do we effectively counter this climate of lies and disinformation? And do you think, uh, how will this impact people believing in the next election? Well, I mean, I think it's a crucial question. I don't have like a magic wand on this, but that's what my Democracy Summer Project is all about. It's going out and giving young people real facts and real education and, um, you know, empirically and scientifically based ways of thinking about the world. And instead, we've got a party which is in denial about COVID-19, is in denial about who won the election. I mean, Donald Trump repeated on January 6, 2022, that he won the election and that the insurrection took place on November 3rd when it was stolen, despite the fact that 61 different federal and state courts rejected every claim of electoral fraud and corruption that Trump's lawyers ever brought forward, including eight judges appointed to the federal bench by Trump himself. They rejected it also. So it's just absolutely fraudulent um, and empty. But obviously, if you set up those kinds of lies, um, people will start denying anything. I mean, there were Holocaust revisionists out there on January 6th. There were people walking around with T-shirts that said Camp Auschwitz staff on them on January 6th. And in that culture of lying, propaganda, and disinformation, you know that Holocaust revisionism is going to, I mean, that's like the template for them. So that's going to be all over that kind of uh, reactionary, irrationalist subculture which has been allowed to grow up. So, um, the, you know, it's not hard to refute their lies. It's hard to get millions of people who are indoctrinated in them to listen. Um, but 
I talk to the cult deprogrammers and their whole movements against cults. And what they say is you've got to show respect, you've got to show care and affection, but you have to be emphatic about what's truth and what's not true. You know, what, what are facts and what are lies? Um, and we, we got to stick to that because if we let go of it, um, democracy, justice, freedom, everything just will disappear. So 50 years from now, how will this period of time be reflected in the history books? Well, and that's up to us. The, the you know, the, the history of our future and our present has not been written yet. Um, and uh, we would like to hope that the whole Trumpist movement could be regarded as um, just a deranged outburst um, that came and went, like maybe McCarthyism um, or, um, you know, it could become the defining struggle of our time. And um, uh, we dare not fail in... Um, in defeating that authoritarian movement. So let's let's say that history will record that um, millions and millions of small D Democrats, big D Democrats, um, Republicans like Liz Cheney, constitutional patriots, independents got together and rejected the lies and the disinformation and um, the twisted will to power that has been driving the Trump movement. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And on that note, uh, we have to close. Uh, thank you, Congressman Raskin, for taking time out of what I know is an extremely busy schedule to spend uh, an hour with us. Uh, thank you, Amy. Uh, and I want to thank everybody uh, for joining us. Again, please go to momentmag.com where you can sign up for next week's Zoominar, where we'll we'll be talking about the Kings and the Rothschilds working together in Atlanta uh, to fight for civil rights. Uh, again, thank you both, and we will thank see you everybody Susan. next time. Thank you. Bye-bye.